we're live. Hi guys. Hello. I, I think we will just get a sound check and verification from everyone that you can see and hear us and then we'll try and get started. But let's, if we can, please just let us know in the live chat box to the side if you can see us and you can hear us clearly. I think that's that's a very important thing because I, from previous experiences, we have started the session, we started talking, getting into the depth of what we're talking about, and somebody's like, I can't hear anything. So yeah. <laughs> we really, really want to make sure that this session runs really smoothly. Uh, and technology-wise, we, we have uh, implemented some few things and let's see if it works out uh, as we're just testing everything <laughs> as we fly. So we're getting that it's all clear. So that's fantastic. I think we're okay to start then. No, I'm just 100% want to make sure. Is the voice clear? Like, are you listening to me clearly? There is no background sound. There is no crackling somewhere. Or you can hear me, but you can't hear Ibris or something of that. So you talk. It says we can hear both of you clearly. 100%. 100%. Let's, all right. Let's just introduce ourselves in the meanwhile. If anyone <laughs> says anything during the introduction, then we're set. So my name's Abriz. And I'm Ibrahim. And we both run Roads UK. And so we thought, um, as internal medicine trainees, when we figured out how to you know, go from a non-training job into a training job, it, it took a bit of digging around. So we thought it would be a really good idea to have a session where we kind of cover all of the important topics related to how you can get into specialty training in the United Kingdom, things about like you know the competition ratios, your portfolio, um, stuff about your crest, your FY2. So, the main topics that we're going to kind of go over and the objectives of today's lesson and the things that I think you guys will, will like to know before we get started are as follows. So we're going to talk about the structure of specialty training in the United Kingdom. We're going to compare training in the UK to your country. And what I mean by that is we'll just kind of give you an idea of what the training is here. And then it's really, I mean, it's a good idea if you know what the training is in your own country so that you can understand certain terms and what we're explaining. And also the differences, I'd say, because... Uh, just just to cut you off. Sorry. No, that's right. Uh, if you understand what the post graduation is like in your country, then it makes it hundred times easier to explain how post graduation is in the UK. Because if you have a solid idea how and uh, and in which which pathway a doctor progresses uh, after MBBS or primary medical qualification in your own country, then you can think about oh, this is like this. So special training is like this. What we would have done in back in our home country. Mm. So that makes it much easier. So the other topics that you can already see, opportunities and challenges in different specialties where we talk about, uh, uh, a lot of people ask about what is the scope of this specialty? Like, you know, uh, whether uh, it will be easier or difficult to go into that specialty. Yep. Uh, and also what, what challenges you can face. Application timelines and eligibility, which is very crucial uh, to understand uh, uh, when you are in a non-training job, of what time you should time frame you have to do everything before you can apply for your training, and also planning your application or portfolio, which comes hand in hand. And then obviously we will go into live Q and A. If yes. you all have any questions during the session, just leave it in the chat box, and we'll go we'll go through it at the end. But feel free to ask whatever questions you have related to the topic of specialty training in the UK and everything else that we discussed. Okay. Please refrain from asking unrelated topic questions because that will just kill more time and we will just have to sift through and skip your questions unfortunately. The topic today is specialty training in the UK. Please I invite all the questions related to specialty training of any specialty, whatever specialty you are interested in. Uh, and uh, we will, f if I don't know anything right at the moment, if Ibris doesn't know anything right at the moment, we can show you the way where you can find the information yourself in our today's live session. So let's start with the first topic. Um, in, in case, guys, you'll notice we'll look down a couple of times, and we do apologize for that. It's just because we're running everything in front of us, and we want to make sure everything's tip-top. So the first thing that we wanted to really talk about was about the structure of specialty training in the UK. So, Ibrahim, I'm going to let you take this part. All right. So, thank you. <laughs> so, we, we already uh, were running a course where we have uh, coming up with four videos already about different uh, pathway and everything. So I think the structure of specialty training in the UK, if I want to talk to you about briefly, it all starts after medical graduation in the UK. There is an internship period, which is called foundation program or foundation years. So foundation years is like your internship, foundation year one is completely equivalent to what you do as an intern back in your home country. 
Foundation Year 2 is a fully registered doctor in, uh, in UK, uh, which is like post-internship work, whatever you do. If your internship is one year, that means you don't have any Foundation Year 2. But in the UK, internship is two years. That's why they have Foundation Year 2. So after the Foundation Year 2, uh, the doctors gain more, like, you know, the competencies of a Foundation doctor. They complete the two years of Foundation training, and then they apply for specialty training. So depending on which specialty they go after, there can be two pathways. One is a coupled pathway, which is run through, and another is uncoupled pathway, which is many of the specialties. So it, the primary thing you have to know or you have to understand is what is your specialty? Is it a run through specialty or an uncoupled specialty? Say for example, as we are in right now, say we want to do anything medicine related in the future. Say Ibris wants to be a, a gastroenterologist or I want to be a geriatric uh, consultant or something of that sort. It's just say because nothing is sure. So to become a gastroenterology trainee or to, to get into gastroenterology training, a doctor cannot directly go into gastroenterology training or cardiology training or renal medicine training or respiratory training. All of this training pathway is uncoupled with internal medicine training. So internal medicine training is the first part that, that you have to complete and get into and complete the internal medicine training, gain all those competencies, complete membership exam like MRCT, and only then you can apply for the specialty of choice. So internal medicine training is in between, uh, I mean, in, uh, it's the buffer. Is, is the buffer before yeah. you go into any specialty training to super specialize. So you cannot become a consultant in internal medicine. There is nothing of that sort because all the consultant that goes into medicine, they can actually dual specialize in yeah. cardiology and general medicine. They can do nephrology and general medicine, neurology and general medicine if they want to in their specialty. Geriatric medicine, general medicine, medicine. and stroke. So That's general also medicine possible. can be covered. So just this is plain view. Now, obviously, we are medicine that we know medicine through and through. If we talk about something else like pediatrics, it's there is no uncoupling. You yeah. get into ST3 and you finish the ST1. two. ST1. ST1, sorry. ST1 and you finish the entire training in one go like OBGYN finish the training awesome. in one go. Yep. Surgery as well is uncoupled. You cannot start general surgery training straight away. There is a buffer which is called core surgical training. I mean, I say you cannot, but there is a, obviously a, 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 a thing later on which we'll, yeah, we'll talk com about. come into. So the training structure you have to understand. So core surgical training is the first one and then the general surgery training, urology training, vascular surgery, plastic surgery, whichever surgery you want. But for neurosurgery, there is run through pathway. You can get into neurosurgery ST1. You can get into cardiothoracic surgery ST1. If you're really confused about what this, what I'm talking about, we have an extensive YouTube video where Ibris talked about run through and uncoupled specialty that describes everything in detail. I also have a video about training pathway in the UK where I have in a chalkboard video, we have discussed everything in detail. Please after watching this whatever session, go into that video and find more information there as well because within the scope of this video, we cannot go at length. No, we'll, we'll link everything at the very end as well. But yeah. it's just a matter of to say now, if you are someone who's already completed an acceptable postgraduate qualification, for instance, MRCS or MRCP or MRCOG, what you need to keep in mind is if you then want to apply directly into specialty training, okay, you have to make sure that your competencies are meeting to what they want before you've applied for that training. So for instance, like Ibrahim said, if you wanted to do you know, gastroenterology and you've already completed MRCP back home, so you want to avoid doing internal medicine training again because you've met those competencies already in a way because you've already done the, the membership exam. But there are other competencies that you have to complete. So an individual who goes through internal medicine training, they've already gotten their crest form signed beforehand or they've completed an FY2 standalone and then they've gone into IMT. On completion of IMT, they will have these competencies signed off, these core competencies that allow them to go into specialty training. If you decide to skip that route, you will need to have these alternative core competencies signed off. So I, I just want to add one thing here. I think this is a very crucial idea that you have to absorb to understand the specialty training. So all the specialty training that we're talking about, all these are curriculum based. So someone, at the top chair at a royal college or a group of people made a curriculum that uh, an internal medicine doctor year one 
has to has to be able to do this 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 means they have to do they have to be able to talk to a patient they have to able to manage a cardiac arrest under direct supervision they have to uh, uh, break bad news so all those minute things are curriculum made so for an internal medicine training for year one for year two for year three for core surgical training year one year two they have a curriculum made all those curriculum pointers are called competencies so if you meet something then you meet a competency so to prove that you are actually capable of doing what an internal medicine trainee does you have to work your work towards meeting those competencies yeah so you say if you have completed MRCP already uh, back at home and you came here and, and joined as a SD3 or whatever specialty it is but you have not gone through internal medicine training so your target is to prove to your consultant that I can do everything that an internal medicine trainee is supposed to do. I can do everything that a core surgical trainee is supposed to do. So you have to prove to them and then they will sign off the alternative form. So that if you go through the alternative core certificate form for internal medicine trainee, for core surgical trainee, you'll find a lot of boxes that the consultant will have to tick. Like this, this doctor can do this, this doctor can do this. So to prove that, you'll have to prove to them by maintaining your own portfolio. Like we are in training right now, we have a portfolio which our clinical supervisor, our educational supervisors are always looking at yeah. and seeing whether we're actually ticking the boxes. But if you want to skip this entire training curriculum, then you'll have to do it yourself. So like we did, that we did not go through any foundation training, but we, as a trust gate doctor, we did everything that a foundation year two doctor would do as their training and we did it ourselves with our own accord and we went to the consultant like I have done this case-based discussion I have done this clinical evaluation exercise I have done this DOPS procedure I have talked to this family this consultant can confirm this this consultant can confirm this I put together all evidences and went to one consultant and said that I have done everything an FY2 would have would done you? and they said that's fantastic and that's why they signed our trust form so that is the pathway to overcome a, a, a training there is no other shortcut. Just passing an MRCP does not make you a uh, consultant, essentially. Or, or you don't have to. I mean, you can't bypass the clinical aspect of your training. Exactly. So you having M MRCP does not uh, does not prove that you have all the competencies of a core surgical training. You have to work clinically and, uh, and produce show. produce competent proofs clinically to prove that you are a core surgical training. Now. All those alternative certificates does not have to be a UK consultant, but many of the things that are already in that certificate, it can be quite difficult to prove that you have done that back at your home, but it's all up to you. If you can prove with documentary evidences, yeah. no, I have done this, I have done a quality improvement project back in Bangladesh, I have done an audit, I have done presentations, I have done these procedures and everything that you are asking me to do, and the consultant back in your home country has signed you off, you're good to go. You can find these forms on Oriel, O-R-I-E-L, and you can count on, either if you need to get the Crest form signed to get into a CST or IMT level post, you can find it there, and you can also find the alternative core competencies there if you're looking to apply directly into specialty training. Now, I know we said that there are run-through trainings, and that means you have to start from the bottom up, from an ST1 post and above, but there is a bit of a caveat in that in pediatrics and in obs gyne, you can occasionally, occasionally, please take this all with a very big grain of salt, occasionally you can find training posts available in the middle of that run through training where you can apply. These seats are very limited and very competitive. So if you're someone who's already completed, you know, MRCOG or MRCPCH back home and you have some experience and you don't think that you want to start all the way from an ST1 level, you may find an ST4 post where you can apply. But again, like I said, limited seats, very competitive. That doesn't mean you shouldn't try for it, but just know before you start that that is an option out there for you to do, all right? If you then also have an MRCP or MRCS done and you decide, or really an MRCP done, and then you decide to do IMT, that's okay. That won't prevent you from doing anything. But there are certain trainings that have caps or limitations on how much experience you can have before you can start in a uncoupled section. 
So the specialty training route of it, there's no limitation that you can't have any sort of like experience cap. Sometimes but, they do. But yeah, for yeah. the most part. But for like, for instance, for core surgical training, core surgical training has a cap. If I'm not mistaken, I think ACCS anesthesia has a cap. Yeah. Yep. And All this information. a lot of these, yeah, that you can basically find um, within our posts have caps. That means if you are over experienced, for instance, for like surgery, you can't have more than 18 months. If you're over experienced in this, you cannot apply in core surgical training. That doesn't mean that you can't apply for surgical training, specialty training. Okay, you can still apply for your surgical specialty training post if you've met all of the requirements in the person's specifications. So sometimes people will message us and be like, oh, well, I have, you know, two years experience of surgery back home. Does that mean I cannot ever become a surgeon in the United Kingdom? No. The reason that they have this cap at a CST level is because they think that you'd be overqualified and you wouldn't get anything new from what they already have. All right. So don't think that you need to hide that. Don't think that it's going to stop you from anything. You can go ahead and still apply at a specialty level MRCS done. After you got the competencies, and competencies together. signed off. So this, this is a question that comes around and we get asked a lot, like, oh, whether there is a uh, overqualification criteria for our training. There is a very easy way to find out, which I'm going to show you right now. So the website is called specialty training dot he dot nhs that you get personal specifications if you google specialty training personal specifications you'll end up here so as you can see all the specialties uh, personal specification is there and i opened here a separate one is core surgical training and see here is the information that you're looking for right here career progression 18 months or less experience in surgery by the time of intended start date that means if you have more than 18 months by the intended start date, you are not capable of applying for this training. So if you go to whichever specialty you want and see if there is any career progression criteria, then you know whether the overqualification is applicable to you or not. So that's the, the, uh, that's the best place. I mean, that's the official place you have to look for it. And uh, this is the way that's the question ends. Okay. So I think with that, we'll, we'll talk about how you can compare how the training works here versus your home country. And I know a lot of times people will ask me, well, in the United States, training is so much shorter. Why would anyone want to come to the United Kingdom and do training? But what they don't realize is the training is structured completely different in the United States and in the United Kingdom. In the United States, after you, you know, apply for the match, you've applied directly into the training that you want to get into. It is considered essentially a run through training. Okay. So for instance, if I were to do internal medicine in the United States, it would be three years, just as it is three years here in the United Kingdom. Now, after the completion of these three years, I would apply for a fellowship in the United States. What would be the equivalent of specialty training in the United Kingdom? Depending on whatever specialty I want to pursue in the United States, it's a varying number of years, but typically it's about one to four years. And then of course, if I want to super specialize in something that might add another year. So really, if you think about it, if I did something that was a little bit on the longer side, it would maybe take me about five to six years in the United States to be done, to be an attending or the equivalent of a consultant. Okay. Of course, it could be less than that if you choose something that is very straightforward, but I'm just saying for a median average. Now in the UK, now let's say if I were to take that same route and I were to do internal medicine training, that's three years and then specialty training in the United Kingdom, that's five years. Four years sorry, four years. So that would come to seven years. Okay. Sorry. I forgot. We're three years now in IMT, no more ST3. So with those four years and the three years of IMT, that's seven years. But again, it can go up or down because IMT is two years. If you do a non-acute specialty versus doing an acute specialty. So now you might be like, well, then why would you come here? But you don't realize is the individual who has now specialized in the United Kingdom, when they get to the very end, like we mentioned before, they have this thing that you could be dual accredited in different kind of in, in, in different specialties. So for instance, if somebody was really gunning to kind of cover all their boxes and they want to really get a lot of accreditations, someone wanted to do internal medicine training. Okay. They did the three years of internal medicine training and then they went through the specialty training. Now they're at seven years. What did they do their specialty training in? Let's say they did it in geriatric medicine. All right. So now they are essentially certified in two things in general medicine, because they have an on-call rota as an acute medical registrar and in geriatric medicine, because that is their specialty training. 
If they didn't decide to tack on one more year, they could be specialized in stroke medicine. So that gives that person a basically three things that they are specialized in. They are specialized in general medicine, they are specialized in geriatric medicine, and they are also a stroke physician. So those are three things that they're done with at the end of essentially seven to eight years, depending on how they map it all out. The person in the United States, however, even though they would get to it at a shorter time span, they would not be certified in all of these things because the U.S. is not built like that. Okay. So to just just cut the long story yeah, short, that, UK sorry, it's just, it's like yeah, UK special training structure is is made to make you jack off a few trades, and U.S. specialty structure is master of one. I want to say yeah, <laughs> if, if you think of it with the U.S., it's like you throw a dart at a dartboard and that's it. It's just one straight line, and you aren't looking left, you aren't looking exactly. right. In in the UK, you will find a respiratory medicine consultant who can do a lot of things in acute medicine yeah. and do things as a respiratory consultant and have a super specialization. But within the US, you will find that it's be very niche what they're doing, which is fine. I mean, nothing is wrong in either route. But when people ask this, they have to also understand how much of a difference the structure of the training is. And also, I want to point it out to another completely different structure of specialty that I think also runs in India and Bangladesh, uh, training under a university. like. Uh, the path of MD uh, and MS and all the master's degree. So in, in a residency kind of thing that it's called in Bangladesh as well. So that's not the case in the UK. You don't train under a university. You are training under royal colleges. These are the professional organizations who is making the uh, uh, the curriculum for your training and you are being, because I'm a trainee under royal college of physicians, uh, uh, the surgeons are training under the royal college of surgeons. The, uh, the, all, the, all of them are these are faculties which makes the curriculum in the UK. So the universities are not involved in this. Yes, there are universities which runs master's degree, but that is not part of your clinical pathway. That's your academic pathway. But if you want to take that pathway, you're most welcome and that will enrich your portfolio. Yeah. Like um, many of the consultants in uh, many of the uh, senior trainees at their ST three, four time, they want to get a master's done or after just becoming a consultant, they want to get a master's done. So that adds that into their portfolio. They have gained some academic excellence. They do some research. They take some out of uh, training uh, to do some research. And, uh, and obviously research is a part of the whole. And if you want to do diploma, you can do diploma at any time. So someone's, uh, some, many doctors do diploma after internal medicine training. They do a postgraduate diploma in something which add points to their application for their uh, specialty training. So academic pathway is completely separate. You don't get an MD at the end of your training. You don't get an MS at the end of your training. You get CCT or CESR or whichever yeah. pathway you take. That's a completely different discussion. So you get a certificate of completion of training. So I think we prolonged our structure of training a lot. Let's no, but I think that's, that's part of the comparison of, of, of how it is, though. Um, but let, let, yeah, let's talk about the opportunities and the challenges. Yeah. Because I think that's something a lot of people ask. People will message us and be like, what is the easiest specialty to get into in the United Kingdom? Or what specialty doesn't require a lot of exams or a lot of work? The fact of the matter is, guys, we're already in this in the long run. We're, we're medics. We're doctors. It's, it's a long haul for all of us. There's always going to be exams. There's always going to be stress. And there are always going to be challenges. My thing is, choose the specialty that you are passionate about and it won't feel like you're working as much. I mean, it's just, it's just down to that. Yeah. And don't think, I'm saying this just in one way, but don't, you know, don't think just because you're a woman you have to be a GP. <laughs> I, I, I'm saying this because a lot, of people, a lot of people message me and say, well, you know, I, I'm a woman, I have to do general practice. No, you don't. I intend, fully intend on being an acute medical registrar one day, and if you want to do that, you can do that. You, you should not limit yourself to any sort of specialty on your gender, and you shouldn't limit yourself to any specialty based on your age. Sometimes people will message us and say, well, I'm already 35 or I'm already, already 40. I don't want to do all of this again. And that's fine. If you don't want to go through the entire training process again, if you feel like it's too much time to do a long training again, I understand that. But don't think that it can stop you from doing that training. There are no age limits that you can, you cannot be discriminated based on your age in the United Kingdom. I mean, we worked with someone when we were in geriatrics who was basically, who had finished med school when we were born, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. No, and not probably. about yeah about That's that a stretch, time. But I think I was I mean, in fifth was, grade. Yeah, she has my that. We were like in, in like fourth or fifth grade, and she had finished med school, and she came back. She joined training. Why not? I mean, so you you just take the inspiration. I love how relaxed it is with with a lot of the local doctors here. They don't care if their training takes them a little bit longer because for them it's more about the journey to get to becoming a consultant rather than the race 
to become a okay. consultant, if that makes sense. Okay, uh, I just wanted to add, like, you know, uh, uh, the main, uh, another idea that is really, really different as a specialty trainee uh, compared to back home that we are coming from, general practice or GP. GP is, is like in my home country in Bangladesh, after MBBS, you just complete MBBS and you can actually start a GP practice of your own and there is no further training or anything required. I, I'm not sure whether it's the same in different countries as well, but it's like when I, when I came here and learned that to become a GP, you have to do three years of training. I was like, oh, I can just become a GP after I passed MBBS back home, but that's not the case. So you have to complete a three years of training. So that makes it a run through training like radiology that's a run through training for five years so all the trainees whichever specialty if you're asking in the live chat right now let's talk about this specialty let's talk about this specialty it's impossible there are hundreds of specialties we cannot sit in a live session and talk about hundreds of specialties you can find out about one specialty right so if you are thinking about finding out one specialty first start with finding out whether it's a run through specialty or an uncoupled specialty. If it's an uncoupled specialty, what is the first part of that training? Then you take forward from there. It's it's that easy. If you're talking about like, I want to know about uh, say, uh, rheumatology. Say I want to know about rheumatology. I want to be a rheumatologist. I want to be a dermatologist. Find out whether rheumatology is a run through specialty or an uncoupled specialty. Oh, I found out dermatology is an uncoupled specialty. Okay, then what is the first part of the dermatology training? Internal medicine training. So now I have to find how can I do internal medicine training to get into dermatology? If you don't want to get into internal medicine training, then you have to find how can you bypass internal medicine training by showing your competencies to a consultant in the UK or at home country and getting an alternative course certificate signed. Go to the dermatology person specifications as I showed the uh, 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 website the earlier, see what are the entry criteria and fulfill that. You can do that. So if we just look at the different competition ratios, yes, if we I just just pull that up for a second. So this is something I think that will at least help you decide on where you want to go. So these are last year's competition ratios, as this year's has not been produced just yet. But with these competition ratios... Acceptance rate and field rate first. Essentially, yeah. yeah. All right, so if we look at it this way. First things first, guys, we're looking at this, and the most important thing you have to remember is there used to be a resident labor market test. That meant you could not apply if you did not hold a settled visa status like British citizenship or EU or EEA citizenship in this country, then you had to wait for the second round for most specialties before you could apply, especially the really competitive specialties, okay? Now that that's gone from October of last year, international medical graduates from any country, it does not matter what your visa status is, if you are otherwise qualified and you meet the person's specifications, you can apply in round one. This is literally a game changer. It levels the playing field. You don't have to worry about what is IMG friendly like people do in the United States because really everything becomes IMG friendly now because they don't care about your passport. They don't care if you need a visa. It's not like in the US where there are only certain specialties that will offer you a visa. It's not like that at all. So whatever specialty you have at the core of your heart that you want to apply for, you can apply for. So when we look at the fill up rates, when we look at how competitive a specialty is, that can kind of give you that basis to understand is it something that you want to aspire to. No specialty is easy to obtain. You can't just expect to come to a, you know, a training program and not have to put a little bit of effort in. You can say that some specialties may be less competitive than others by the sheer reason that there are more seats available versus the amount of people applying towards it. So re keep that in mind. So if there are 3,000 GP seats available and only 1,000 people apply, you can say then that it's a fairly low competition. That's a no competition. I mean, everybody I'm just giving it. an example. Just, there's no, so, I mean, there's no competition, because right? Everybody will get it. Because everybody yeah. would get a seat. Or uh, alternatively for surgery, if there's only 500 seats but 1,000 people apply, that means it's there's going to be some competition. So when people hear, oh, but I hear it's really hard to get into a surgical specialty or a gynecological specialty or any of these competitive specialties, because it's just that. It's because this is just competitive. There are people applying and there aren't that many seats. And I'm sure that's true in every country in the world. I've never heard that, that a country will need as many surgeons as they will need medics. And it's just so, a simple yeah, reasoning. Just to easily find out how competitive is your specialty of choice is, you have to look at some data, as you can see here, uh, it's called the acceptance and fill-up rate. So as you can see, all the top ones, in 2019, they had only 10 posts in cardiothoracic surgery in the entire United Kingdom. 
and obviously all 10 of them who got selected they accepted it because there <laughs> is a reason they were not accepted so 100 is the fill-up rate so as you can see uh, uh histopathology only had 75 seats neurosurgery has 20 seats uh core surgical training had 500 seats only just go down the list general practice had 3000 seats intermedicine training has 1300 seats so all these posts or seats that they had in this uh, specialty in terms of how many people applied that will be the competition ratio i think we have it here yeah so as you can see here how many people applied is it the competition ratio and how many people accepted is the acceptance rate see so that means this is all about round one because in 2001 there was round one so in core psychiatry training or so in pediatrics training there are 400 seats available but only 284 people accepted it that means all the remaining seats went to round two so for cardiothoracic surgery 10 seats available 10 people accepted so there was no seats available for round two so that's how this whole thing works and what is a competition ratio competition ratio is how many people applied so core surgical training just to give a reminder just because i applied for core surgical training that doesn't mean that i cannot apply for imt or gp yeah. Yeah. so application competition ratio is a bit blurred but at the same time you have a general idea where people are applying more and thus where people are more interested thus where the competition is more so as you can see for general practice for 3000 seats 5000 people applied and all this competition ratio will actually give you an idea about where you have more competitions like in gynecology stp for 262 seats 500 people applied that means uh, a, a lot of people applied for st1 so neuro neurosurgery st1 for 24 seats almost 150 200 people applied so that makes a competition ratio for one post almost six and a half person applied so the more higher the competition ratio of a specialty of choice the better you have to be than everybody else yes and again we want to make it very clear that doesn't mean you have to have a british passport yeah not, it's based on you now exactly how good so, you are yeah so that that's where the whole portfolio guidance comes in so what what is the portfolio if you want to Talk about um, I think I want to make sure that we got over, we talked about application timelines, guys. I yeah. know we talked a little bit about when being eligible, but I just want to make sure when it comes to the application timelines, you have to see on the Oriel website or within the websites of these specific training routes when they open and when you have to have everything ready. And, and to make clear that we do have an article about it and whatever you will ask, we have an article about it. So there we go. So when do special training August 2020 round one uh, the advertisement all is available in our website you just have to go through it and make a mental note and time frame on which date is the uh, application is starting and round one re-advert which is misnomerly called round two and for STP this is the general timeline so there you go so you know from here when the uh, the special training application opens so with this knowledge what you can do, you can make a, a progress for your uh, portfolio, like mm. what you have to achieve. Right. Like if you know that in next November, uh, the whole application will start, that means I have to do everything before November. I have to uh, gather all the evidences and everything. Because yeah, you may gather evidences later on and present in your interview, that's, that's well and good, too, but, but you have to be at least eligible. So what are the primary eligibility criteria that I can I need to obtain before applying for the training? So having a time frame in mind so as you can see non-training jobs are available around the year and you can just go into NHS jobs website and apply for jobs and uh, wherever they are open uh, if they call for an interview they call for an interview training jobs are not like that so training jobs has a specific timeline where the adverts are open and you can apply and all the application for training are done via Oriel Oriel website O-R-I-E-L Oriel website yeah. okay so you cannot prepare your application like you prepare a your application in or something NHS like that. jobs okay. uh, pro make a profile there no uh, the application will open when the advert is open so you cannot do everything beforehand on Oriel side so you have to be uh, very ready for the date yeah yeah so beyond all that how will you now put together that kind of a portfolio or put together that kind of an application that you are now set and you will get into that training now 
we talked about the competition ratios and so there's an application portion and then there's an interview portion for all of these trainings so you want to be able to get shortlisted with your application and then progress obviously to, to get to the point where you get interviewed where there's going to be another shortlisting to whether or not you actually are selected into that specialty training or into that uncoupled training all right if you go through the criteria of whatever training you're interested in you can see there what they want now if you've already met a lot of these competencies, like for instance, for Crest, you know, you've done an audit or a quality improvement pro project that will already start giving you points. Certain things like master's degrees or any other kind of postgraduate degrees or PhDs, MSCs, they can also give you points. Don't think that without them that you cannot, you know, get into that specialty. But if it's a fairly competitive specialty, it would be useful for you to have that as an added thing in your portfolio or in your application because it'll give you the points. Other things like research and publications that you can do within your hospital or even back home. That doesn't mean you have to do everything in the United Kingdom. If you've documented everything that you've done back home, even right now with everything that's going on, if you're not able to travel anywhere but you're able to do things in your home country, you can already start working on your application. Um, other things you can think about doing are, while you're in the UK even as a non-trainee are going to certain seminars, courses, conferences, participating in things that will give you you know, continuing med medical education or um, kind of experience or CPD points that you can also show as commitment to specialty and that you can show that you are really dedicating to doing this in the long run and you want to do these things because without doing these things, you know, why would that person want to choose your application? So when you submit the application, you know, they don't know anything else about you besides what you've put together in that, in that document. So you want to present your best, you know, efforts. Don't put things that aren't relevant, obviously but put everything that's directed towards what you're trying to achieve, okay? So, so if I you wanna, yeah. I, 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 I just wanna show you one thing because uh, I think that's, that's a, a, gut, a structure is needed uh, when, when you're trying to put together a portfolio like so that you don't do one thing over and over again and forget to do another thing. Like say, uh, yes, audits are important, but there is no point doing five, six, seven audits and not having any publication. Yes, publications are important. There is no point doing six, seven, eight publications and not doing a quality improvement project. So finding the balance and ticking all the boxes in a portfolio. So where do you find it? So we have an article about uh, the surgical training in the UK where we have listed this, all those things that you can do. So as you can see, postgraduate degree or qualification, CPD courses, quality improvement or clinical audit, teaching experience, training in teaching, presentations, publications, leadership and management, commitment to surgery, clinical or procedural experience in both surgical. So all these things actually goes into your portfolio and that is how you boost it. There is no easier way to explain this. I can explain in another way for ST3 scoring. If you go into this ST3 application scoring here, you will see that what, what are the things that is here. You can say undergraduate degrees, what undergraduate degree will give you what points what postgraduate degree will give you. This is the place, if you had done an MD, then you'll actually can gain six points here. So what prizes and awards will give you points if you had actually uh, got any national prize related to medicine, if you have completed MRCP uh, before the ST3, if you have done presentations, if it was a presentation or an international medical meeting or even a national medical meeting you're invited or selected to do so, then you can get eight points. Then if you have a publication which was first author or two or more PubMed sites for original research publication, you'll get eight points. If you have teaching experience, that you have worked with local tutors to design and organize a teaching program, you'll get seven points. If you've done a QI project, if you've done something of leadership, that hold the national leadership and everything. So as you can see, I can go on and on from the website that is publicly available. So why can't you? So. <laughs> So that's the thing in enriches your portfolio. All the things, application scoring. So now if you are interested about, about radiology, go into Google, say radiology, specialty training, application scoring. Find the related information, like what do I have to put in my portfolio so that it will prove to be more useful in my application because that will give you higher points and enrich more in portfolio. I think the beauty of the UK training system is that all the information is there Fantastic. and people are really more than willing to help you. If you start out in a non-training job, if you find your clinical supervisor or if you find someone else in that specialty that you're interested in going into, just ask them what did they do, what did they show. And it might seem like it's a lot of work, it might seem really daunting that oh my god I have to do this, I have to do that, I have to do that. 
But if it's a really competitive specialty, it comes with it. I can't think, even in your home country, if you wanted to apply for cardiothoracic surgery, there's only 10 seats here. I can't imagine it would be very easy in any country in the world to just walk in and be like, yes, I want to be a cardiothoracic surgeon. And all you've done is just, you know, basic general surgery for one or two years. You have to show all of that work into it. And I'm sure all of you guys can. Don't think that there are any limitations put on you. The only limitations you put on are the limitations that you think that you have, that I can't do this because I can't do that, or I don't want to do this, or I can't do this because of time that's passed. It's just you stopping yourself, okay? So I think we've kind of covered all the topics that we had mentioned in the beginning as our points of discussion. So I'll open it up to the Q&A session on the right-hand side. Guys, if you want to- Before, before, sorry. sorry. <laughs> before going into the Q&A session, as we have already uh, re reached to a point that we have very compactly discuss the specialty training in the UK. Whatever we have done, we can obviously uh, arrange more sessions and more sessions. But yeah. to understand what we can improve more, we need your feedback. Please. We definitely need your feedback. And I just put the link out there in the live chat. It's and also it, in the description box. Also in the description box. I would urge everybody, please, who are uh, watching our live session, please go to the feedback form that have been given on the live chat. Uh, by Road to UK and please give us some feedback. Uh, it won't take comments. more than two minutes. It, it's, it's like just five a questions. Few, five questions or anything, yeah. but we really, really want to get the comments from you guys. Like, what do you want further? Uh, how can we better structure the whole session? Uh, were we going too fast? I think I was going too fast. <laughs> You're going too fast. I talk but, fast. <laughs> so yes, I understand that it's 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 really daunting to organize a specialty training in the UK when there's so many specialty to talk about and so many kind of things. And that's why we are working our best to get the articles out. If you go to our website at, uh, at the blog post, as you can see here, that uh, training in various specialties, as we already made articles about pediatrics in the UK, OBGYN, radiology, anesthesia, emergency medicine. So if you're asking about radiology, have you read this article? That's the thing. <laughs> so uh, this article has already discussing about everything uh, about the radiology training in the UK uh, from like, top to bottom, uh, uh, what a IMG has to do. All right, so. I'm gonna start from the top. I'm gonna roll up and we're gonna try and get through all the questions. So the first one we have here, please give information regarding ways to a good portfolio right from the beginning of your PLAB journey. I hope during the process of our webinar, we already answered that question because I feel like we did, but if not, you can ask some more at the bottom. But like just to recap, essentially, look through the person's specifications and the criteria of whatever specialty training or training post that you're looking into and target from day one that you want to get publications, audits, quality improvement projects, etc. Teaching. Teachings in that direction. Okay. Make a list, like we had a list. Uh, like we have to get a teaching done. So when we both got our separate days teaching done and at the journal club done, we didn't actually look for any other opportunities of teaching. When you got our audit done, we look for something else. So yeah. if you have a target in your mind, so these are the things, as I said earlier, for your application scoring, what things, obviously it's impossible that to get a PhD done. Like, you know what I mean? I if you're already not that yeah. in path. So make achievable targets, uh, what you can achieve. When you start working in the NHS, to get a teaching done, it's not that difficult actually. No. You just have to talk to the right people. You have to just talk to the consultant that I want just to do a teaching and everything. You have to be communicative with other people. Be very That's proactive. Set be your own proactive. personal Because you are a non-trainee, as we said. Yeah. You are a non-trainee. If you are a non-trainee, you don't have a curriculum to go through. You just hire to do the work. But you have to think about your progression. And that's why you have to know these things and knock at the right door to get things done. Yeah. All right. Um, you guys are doing such a commendable job. Keep posting such high quality content. Ah, that's so Thank sweet. You. Thank you. <laughs> um, the question with that is, can I come to the UK after MRCP2 in India and work in a non-training job and then finish cases? What you'll need to be concerned about is how you would get GMC registration. Now, if you've already completed two parts of MRCP and you otherwise don't have any gaps or any breaks in your clinical practice, you would be suitable for the medical training initiative, or MTI, um, which you would then come on a tier five visa and you could do paces. And then if you decide to stay in the United Kingdom, you could then apply for a job and you'd switch to a tier two visa. So there are three things. You have to either complete PLAB, you have to either complete MRCP, or you can come via the sponsorship route, which is MTI. So whenever you're thinking about, I want to work in the UK, you have to think about three things, whether I've done any of these three. You have done PLAB? No. Have you completed MRCP? No. Then I'll go for sponsorship route. We have a detailed article about medical training initiative 
go to our website on the up i think the right corner there is a search bar search their medical training initiative then you can find all things about that so that's the suitable path if you are thinking of your case yeah. that i've completed just two parts of mrcp that gives you a good uh, if you have three years of clinical experience already then you are actually set you just have to follow the path uh, and make email, sure email, otherwise email, email different people yeah. and, 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 and arrange that way doesn't mean you can't do plab let me make that clear you can but it just would make more sense for you to do mti yeah okay um is there a fee for specialty training there is not it's fantastic you get paid to be in training you get paid because you're working so this is a thing that we get asked a lot because i know in a lot of countries you have to pay a fee because it's under a university like ibrahim mentioned earlier but here as you're under a royal college you're within a deanery they are paying you you have a basic pay and on top of that you have some enhancements or some you know extra pay that you would get because you are doing on calls now ibrahim just a couple of days ago did a video actually about a doctor's pay in the uk and how it breaks down and what you could expect at different levels but really it is down to that you are paid the only thing that you are paying for is your gmc registration which is annual and of course any exams that you are paying for to progress within your training but and also there is the a very there is a small fee for the membership that you're keeping yeah. with your royal college that's eventually that's very negligible like yearly i think we pay 300 once you're making pounds, bank yeah. as a consultant no something. for 300 pounds where obviously that's not very negligible fee for just it's it's a how the royal colleges function because if you are if you continue to become a fellow or a member of the royal college you have to continue to pay the fee we know a registrar who she, she is actually a member of a few royal colleges because yeah. she passed so many exams but she cannot use any of the post nominals you know why just because she refuses to pay them i mean it makes sense why <laughs> that, pay all that money so he's like, she's like i i, I have passed mrcp i think she passed other infectious disease faculties yeah. and all the other exams as well but if you don't continue to pay them you cannot use their post nominal so that's the thing mm. as well. <laughs> all right next question is about can i know about specialty in radiology so it's five years it's run through and then we have a post where we talk about the rest because clinical radiology. I will say that a lot of times people wonder where they should start off in a non-training post and I would say A&E is a really good place for radiology trainees. Yeah, yeah because we looked at x-rays all the time in A&E and, and, and we had teaching all, days. And those all x-rays are say uncategorized like people coming with uh, broken bones, so broken mm -hmm. bone x-ray, people coming with head injury, so yep. you have CT scans, people coming with say interception, yeah, abdominal obstruction, pain, abdominal obstruction. So, so there many things, so many kinds of different x-rays and images that you could see on any &E job. So what you can do if you're really wanting to go radiology, which is a very competitive specialty in the UK, because a lot of people wants to go there and that's what makes it competitive. So when you are an A&E doctor, or when you started in emergency medicine, A&E stands for accidents and emergency. It's generally called the emergency department is yeah. called A&E. So yeah, that could emergency be something new. Medicine, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> so, so in your ED or A and E, uh, uh, ask for a taster week in radiology. Yes. Talk to your radiology department. Talk to your EM consultant and a radiology consultant that I want to feature specialize in radiology. Can I have a taster week? Then you can actually get to sit down with a specialty registrar or a consultant and see how uh, the whole thing, how they work, and how the radiology work and everything. Yeah. And I, I'm pretty sure radiology is an exciting place as well. Like. Yeah, whole, they always the have cool, so many computers. Yeah, the cool the IR things they really do nice. as well. Yeah. Like, IR know, stuff, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can go from there. Alrighty, what about critical care medicine? So critical care medicine is really interesting in that you can go through almost any route and end up in crit care. Essentially but though- Intensive care medicine. Intensive care medicine, yes. Yeah. So you could do IMT, you could be GP, you could do ACCS, you could even do anesthetic, surgery or an anesthesia, anesthetic. and you can end up in critical care medicine. The thing that you have to find then is what is most appropriate to you. Do you want to be an intensivist? Do you want to be somebody with a medical background who then proceeds into you know critical care medicine? Or do you want to have more of an anesthesia background, surgical background, general background, whatever works for you. But so their ICM, sorry, the ICM website is fantastic. If you just search. Faculty of Intensive Care Medicine. Just go there. Google will Faculty of Intensive Care Medicine in the UK. They have entire training pathway laid out there. What yeah. is the... In so, you, as I said earlier, these are all uncoupled specialties. You cannot just, oh, now I came to the UK and I want to be in intensive care medicine training. It doesn't work like that. You have to prove the previous pathways or you have to go through the previous pathways and then proceed on to this kind of training. Yep. Alrighty. Please talk about cardiology and interventional cardiology. So if you go via IMT, you then proceed into specialty training cardiology and then you would add a year for interventional cardiology. Yeah. 
if you decide to start at specialty training, you have to already have cleared MRCT and then met the core competencies and the alternative core competencies. Same goes for cardiology. It's a very competitive ST3 specialty. You have to have a very, very well uh, rounded portfolio to get into a cardiology training. So when I say well rounded portfolio, that means you have to have some publications done, some teachings done, some audits done related to cardiology, some quality improvement projects done related to cardiology. Uh, and, and you have to have a very, like, you know, very, you have to show that you're really committed to cardiology already. If you have a master's degree done, that's really good. So all these things adds up to your cardiology application. So when you apply for the cardiology, there will be obviously interview. There is no exam for this specialty training. Only a few, Just, like I think we forgot to mention that, only a few of them okay. has a, a score called Multi Specialty Recruitment Assessment or MSRA. I think radiology has it, OBS Gynae has it, GP, GP has it. So those neurosurgery has it. Those uh, MSRA exam is not clinical exam. It's most like a situational judgment test, like what would you do in the situations? How you prioritize yeah. the task? There are books for that preparation so you can, uh, because that's a part of the recruitment process. Like when you apply, as I said, when the application rounds open, then you have to book a slot. It's like taking a driving test as well. Like, you know, the same company actually runs yeah. MSRA, Pearson, View or whatever. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you have to take a test. It's a computerized test. And then uh, with the score, if you score really high in MSRA, then you get offers directly. You don't have to probably do something. It's all, all in their specialty training. Uh, in general practice, we have an article. Go to our website, search general practice, read the article, then you'll know about it. Yeah. Next question is on the psychiatry pathway. Psychiatry is uncoupled. So you have three years in the core part and then you've got four years, no, it's another three years, another three years if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, three years. So full run through is not there. It's, it's just you've got core three years and then you've got specialty part is three years. So it will take you six years to become a psychiatrist in the United Kingdom. And of course, if you want to specialize throughout that part of your specialty training, specifically, you know, if it's adolescent care or elderly care or eating disorders or what have you, there you go. Cool. Um, is OET accepted for applying an IMT? If yes, what is the required score? If you're already working as a non-training doctor for three months in the United Kingdom, you don't have to actually show any sort of English proficiency exam. You can get a consultant to sign it off. But if, as far as I know, because OET is accepted for GMC registration, you just proceed in that sense. Um, and you need it, to, it, it, you, the same criteria yeah, like what same. is it for GMC is a grade B in all aspect yeah so I don't think there is any change of uh, a criteria no but as I said if you are already working as a non-trainee doctor you just have to go to a consultant there is a GMC English competency form you can download it uh, from GMC's website where, where uh, any consultant can sign you off that form and you can use it as proof that's what we did yeah yeah there is no point taking an OAT or IELTS when you're already working in the NHS and speaking to patients and everything in English. Yeah, yeah. exactly. If somebody can prove it, then you're yeah. set. Any of the consultants can sign you off. And that's the easiest path. Yeah. And that's why we say that starting as an entrepreneur doctor... Kind of helps you a little bit in that yeah. sense. But I mean, you could... It's up, it's up to yeah. you. OBS and Gynae, like we said, is run through from ST1. And as we said before, it might have some seats available in the ST3, ST4 area, but it's really competitive and there aren't that many seats. But otherwise, it can be done. Choosing a specialty in the UK easier than the US, for example, USMLE determines your specialty and as an IMG, you might have to choose a non-desirable. I think we talked about this a little bit, but essentially, like we said, there are no restrictions based on your you know, passport. Yeah. There's or, nothing or, like or, that. Or a lot of people think, is there a restriction between my PLAB score? Oh, no. <laughs> so yeah, it doesn't matter if what you got in PLAB, it doesn't matter what you got in your postgraduate exam, the scores don't matter. Everything is pass fail. So, when you yeah. see in your application criteria, like we already showed a little bit earlier, that's what they're looking at when you apply. They're not looking at you any, know, scores. any scores or anything like that. Even if your med school scores, some people ask if I failed a couple of no, times. But, but the thing is, if you had actually awarded something, like, you know. Yeah, you'll get points uh, for that. You, you, you had, like, you know, had the gold medal in med school. Uh, then that's that's the concept in our country as well. Like if you do really, really well, yeah. I think only ten they or five. Gold medal? They give you gold medal, like yeah. the, the prime ministers or the presidents of the country give you gold medal. So that's a prize. So that gives you points yeah. in your application. There you go. Um, if you're a medical student, go for gold medals. Yeah. Yeah. I am T three completed outside UK and I've passed MRCT Part One. Your options after this. So you wouldn't meet the criteria to enter into specialty training just yet because you've not completed all of MRCT, which is essential criteria. So it would make sense for you to either work in a non-training job, complete all your MRCT, and then apply for specialty training, or just apply for IMT. Yeah. You can apply for IMT. All right, radiology we talked about. Okay, 
If I do FRCR, which level can I enter in UK? So F like FRCR is Austria. already at the end of the training, yeah. would you say? So if you have completed FRCR, that means probably you have been working as a radiologist somewhere in the world. So I think the best pathway for you to become working in the UK is to go for CESR pathway, because I don't see any training for you left to do if you have already passed and completed FRCR in the UK. So I know a lot of doctors who come, the, the radiologists, uh, who proves to the GMC that whatever they have done to complete an FRCR as a working as a doctor somewhere in the world is equivalent to the training that would have provided them in the UK that they get the consultancy post, they get yeah. the specialist registration. So that pathway is called CESR, it's called Certificate of Eligibility of Specialist Registration. So if you go to CESR GMC website, and find out the, what is the radiology, there is a PDF definitely somewhere there, and what is the radiology criteria that you have to prove, and then you can apply, because if you complete an FRCR, I don't see any reason that you have to go through another five again. years of training all over again. Yeah. So you can just do that and become a specialist in the UK. But if you really want to go through the radiology training already, then probably you can look into, as Idris told earlier, that look into uh, a post in SD2 or SD3 if it's available. So it all depends upon you because as the whole radiology training is structured, there is actually no way to enter you at SD4 level or SD5 yeah. level. There is no way because they don't recruit at that level. All the recruit is SD1 level and during the training, a uh, the, the, the trainees completes the FRCA exams. So if already completed all FRCA exams, that means actually you completed the training somehow. Maybe not in the UK, but somewhere else. So that's what you have to prove that whatever I completed uh, outside the UK is equivalent to uh, what, inside they would have done. what they would have done because I passed FRCR. So that's how you can get the specialist registration. So there is a lot of uh, like, I think the best person to talk to would be a radiologist in the UK if you can get hold any of them through social media or email or whoever or talk to as you are an FRCR that means you're a fellow of the radiology mm. royal colleges so talk to any other fellows and see if they can kind of point in yeah. that direction yeah. cool yes this stream will be available as a video later it will save on YouTube and you guys can always rewatch it as and when you need to alrighty how to get into orthopedics after PG from India and after completing MRCS so if you've completed MRCS you still have to get one other thing that's the uh, alternative course on competencies of core surgical training. Yeah. So you either, I'm pretty sure that you have completed PG in India. That means you so obviously experience. work more than 18 months and experience. Yeah. So you cannot join the core surgical training, but you have to come to the UK, work as a non-training doctor in an orthopedic war, or orthopedic or wherever you want to work and get that core surgical training, alternative competence. There's a certificate, alternative course certificate with that signed and your MRC is completed you can apply for orthopedics training. Yep. You can get the evidence of these competencies by checking on the forms. So be it for the CREST form or the alternative core competencies, they literally tell you what they want. Yeah. yeah. And it's easier for you if you keep a portfolio online yeah. already. For instance, like if you are trying for at a, a non-training level at an FY2 or CT1 level to apply for a core post, if your postgraduate medical center gives you access to a, a free portfolio, um, Horacy portfolio, then you can go ahead and do that. Or you can buy a portfolio and keep everything there. So you can log book everything that you've done and that will be the proof that you can then prove when you want somebody to sign it. Do you have some, um, something no, you pull it up? Continue, continue. Okay. Um, a trust grade job is a non-training job. All right. We, before we entered IMT, so we both had internship experience and IMT is one of the prerequisites is that you need to have 12 months of experience after internship to add on before you can apply for IMT. So we had to work for one year and it all kind of lined up perfectly that we worked for one year and then we had applied for IMT during that year. So after three months time, we had gotten our CREST form signed. And then because we still had to apply in round two during the time that we applied, we applied in February. Well, basically we had applied, yeah, in February. And by, by May, we knew where we were getting into an IMT so that by August, we started an IMT in 2019. Okay. Alrighty. Um, just, just to add here. Yep. Uh, I don't know how to show it. Uh. That's cool. I'm gonna get to the next question then. Okay. Um, 
after you pass MBBS and complete internship, should we do PLAB or MRCP or MRCS or should we do MRCP, MRCS? If you're choosing between MRCP or MRCS, you have to decide, do you want to be a medic or do you want to be a surgeon? So MRCS is for surgeon, is membership of Royal College of Surgeons and MRCP is for physicians, which is membership of Royal College of Physicians. So what do you want to be? Do you want to be a surgeon or do you want to be a doctor? physician yeah and, and then depending the on that which route and of course you if you take PLAB you'll have to take one of those postgraduate exams later on to further your your career but if you want to start in the UK faster with less experience PLAB would let you do that so PLAB will get you GMC registration and nothing else but MRCP if you complete MRCP will give you GMC registration and at the same time a progression in your career because right now like as we said we took PLAB because we just completed internship and we obviously didn't because MRCP is not an exam that you all can finish within one year because I'm pretty sure there there is like you know you have to you have to do con- internship con- in the first place and considerable yeah. amount of uh, preparation is needed for MRCP and MRCS both so that's up to you age is not a barrier if you want to apply for training like I said before just apply don't think that's gonna stop you is nuclear medicine part of radiology or is it a separate program I think it's separate but I would suggest you check on, I think it would be on the ST3 recruitment website. I feel like it is separate though. Um, Let me see. No, it's continue, yeah? Okay, sure. All right, so why is UK specialty training years longer than the US ones? I think we talked about that in the main thing. It's just because there's more that a UK specialty training goes through than a US Jack specialty. of some treads and master of one. Yes, versus, <laughs> versus essentially. Um, but that doesn't mean somebody is a better doctor than the other. It's just up to you, like do what you want to do. All right. Um, how different is FY2 for someone who intends to join ophthalmology specialty training? I'm not sure what you mean. If you could rephrase that question, I'll try and get to it. How long will it take for the job market to get saturated? This is not a job. Hold on, hold on. I, I want to wait here until it gets saturated. No, it's, <laughs> we're talking no about one knows, guys. Yeah. Just don't worry about saturation. So, I, know, I just want to say one thing. All doctor's jobs right now are on the shortage occupancy list. So just keep that in mind. Whatever else is happening is happening. Somebody asked about nuclear medicine, so yeah. I just want to clarify here. I think I just found the nuclear medicine uh, uh, personal specification. As you can see, the qualification clearly says you have to have either MRCP part one at the time of or MRCP full by the published deadline. So you can go to, into nuclear medicine training from medicine, from pediatrics, from surgery. Yeah. So I think it's all the But not radiology, because I think that was radiology. the question actually, does it part of, it's not part of radiology then. So, yeah, so that's a ST3, it's a uncoupled. So you have to finish core part of any of the training. So if you are on a physician training or in a pediatric training, then you have to see all you can say, you can either UK core medical training or you can complete SSCS acute medicine program, or you can do pediatric training or you can do surgical training or core competencies. So these are the pathway you can become a nuclear medicine. And uh, how competitive is nuclear medicine? Uh, you can just go to our uh, this article, which will be opportunities, opportunities and challenges, and see what is the competition ratio yeah. there. All right. As someone who's lost between choosing UK and US, which pathway would you recommend, especially for surgical specialties? I think the first thing you should do is check out our video on PLAB versus USMLE and see the cost associated and the time that you would have to dedicate. But really, surgery is a competitive specialty no matter the country. But the one thing that we keep reiterating in this is that in the UK, they will not look at your passport and say you can't apply to a specialty. In the US, they do have restrictions in the sense that there are certain specialties that will not sponsor you for a visa. And that's why people then end up not getting what they want because they're, the range of what they can apply for is, is considerably smaller, okay? But it's not like that in the UK. So keep that in the back of your head. Um, is applying for foundation year dependent on the specialties? I don't, I'm not exactly sure what that. Foundation year, like you are talking about foundation year one or two. No, internship is not dependent on specialty yeah. at all. Yeah. You have to do either, like as an UK graduate, you have to do complete two years. Yeah. And as an uh, international graduate, uh, you, you eventually, you eventually comes out that way. no, it, it, it's not two years. It, it depends on how much time you want to do it. Because as we just work for one year, somebody worked for six months because the target is to gain the foundation competency. Yeah. The least time you have to spend is basically three months, but none of the consultant will just sign you off in three months because we have time. We have to prove them that you actually do and can do all the things the foundation doctors do. So at least six months to one year, I would say you have to spend as a 
at junior doctor level to prove your foundation competencies and then you move on forwards to the specialty training. So we have a lot of questions about how, to, how difficult it is to get into certain trainings. Like we said before, guys, if you just look at the competition ratios, that kind of gives you an idea. Like Ibrahim also said, though, the competition ratios can kind of be a little skewed sometimes because a lot of people apply for multiple specialty trainings. For instance, somebody might apply for GP and IMT and pediatric training, but ultimately they'll only take one, but they filled that quota looking like it makes it seem like Did they've they applied for a lot of places. Which specialty or how competitive is it? No? It's no, no, I just, I just In general, want like for say, instance, uh, orthopedics, let's say. Yeah. Orthopedics. So if they say orthopedics. Yep. Orthopedics is trauma and orthopedics. Yeah, it's trauma and orthopedics. There it is. So if you're asking, okay, Ibris, how competitive is it to get into trauma and orthopedics? Trauma and orthopedics. Yep. Okay. So I will go and find this uh, competition ratio. As I can see, trauma and orthopedic surgery is ST3 because uh, it's a uncoupled Spe specialty. Yep. Only 167 posts and 500 people applied there. That means it's a fairly competitive specialty. That doesn't mean fairly you can't good. get in, though. Yeah. <laughs> but let us make that very clear. Just because you are not British doesn't mean you can't get in. Just because you need a visa doesn't mean you can't get in. If you have a strong application and you present well in the interview, you can get into whatever training you want to get into. So if you have any questions regarding, oh, I just want to know how competitive is radiology, just go to the competition ratio and find out how many people are applying against how many posts. Yes. That gives you an idea about how many how competitive that specialty is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So yes, guys, certain degrees like we had shown in the evidences like master's degrees or MSCs, they will give you added points. You can then again see on those evidences how many points they give you. Again, don't feel obliged that you have to, you know, do a master's degree or anything like that to progress into training. But like we said, if it is a fairly competitive specialty, it would help you because exactly. those are ways to get points. Don't try and do a bunch of things in, in one category. Try and make your application nice and varied. So I, I would just say, if you're thinking about, okay, I want to be a surgeon in the UK, and you already know that surgery is competitive, and you are currently doing a master of like MS degree back in your home country, I would definitely suggest that you finish that and then come. Because that actually, yeah, the master's degree doesn't have to be a UK degree. It can be anywhere else. Yeah. Like it, it can be any university in the world. And, you just have to prove that you completed a master's degree. Obviously, there is some, if it's a research master's or anything of that sort that comes with proof and what you have done during your master's degree. If it was a taught in university, there's clinical work and everything, maintain a logbook. So there is 100% if you have, or if you are completing a master's, don't just leave and come to the UK, do that. Because academic excellences never go away. It always stays in your portfolio. Like if you have completed a master's, you can always say that, I, I have not completed a master's, I'm just a bachelor's degree. But see, if you have completed a master's, you can always say that I've completed a bachelor's degree, I've completed a master's degree. So that always stays with you. Yeah. And that always Adds puts, to your you, knowledge. Uh, no, puts you forward yeah. among other applicants. Yeah. yeah. Alrighty, I see that every specialist is paid the same. Oh, sorry, is every specialist paid the same no matter the specialty? Because I see in the US that they pay differently. So the consultant pay structure in the United Kingdom is really interesting. There is obviously a basic pay that once you become a consultant, you get this basic pay. But with years of experience, depending on how long you're working, they add on to your pay, one. Two, of course, things like enhancements of on-calls in certain specialties, they add to your pay. Three, if you are a GP who has a private practice or any other kind of private specialty, of course, your pay can vary. And then four, if you've gotten some sort of leadership or academic excellence award within your trust or your hospital, that adds on to your pay. So, so <laughs> go ahead. So different specialties have different options or different... Um, chances of doing private work like a trauma and orthopedic doctor can do a lot of private surgeries and earn a huge amount of cash compared to a general medicine consultant i mean what will you do privately you know what i mean so a, 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 yeah, and it, an immunology consultant can have a lot of private practice because a lot of doctors a lot of patients uh, want to be like I, I want to just check whether i have any allergy or not but NHS will give them, say, a clinic date after six months. But if they go private, they can see a consultant the next day. So an immunology consultant can have private practice. So it fairly depends on a specialty. Yeah. Yes, all the specialties that work in the NHS have the same basic pay scale. Like the consultant in general medicine has the same pay scale in a consultant in rheumatology or something. But not necessarily they all get paid the same. Yeah. The thing is, if I... So say for example, hopefully someday, if I have gained 
experiences and I have done courses and researches and all the other things and I want to take a consultancy post in this hospital and the hospital wants me I have chance to negotiate like an emergency medicine consultant are so so in demand in demand they can get paid three times more what actually their other counterparts get paid in some other hospital because maybe this area doesn't yeah maybe this they're area just doesn't experience have and they, this area needs emergency medicine consultant and nobody wants to come here for example for example we're just saying yeah, that doesn't saying, necessarily mean that means experience. whatever pay scale that you're looking at he's getting he's getting actually maybe twice more than that just because he can negotiate so that's there is a thing as yeah. well the, which is not advertised everywhere because that's a negotiation done your when own they're okay. hired it's yeah. on to you exactly. and your skills and of course how many hours you work some specialties require you to work more hours just like an A&E you would normally work more hours than somebody in, in medicine just because it's more stressful like the hours that you work are more unsocial or they're longer hours or you're doing a lot of weekends that adds to your pay if you're working a really relaxed job even as a consultant because you have you can, the option to do that because you're a consultant if you want to work less than full-time obviously all of that would then be less pay so okay? just looking at the pay scale don't get fooled that a consultant get paid so less yeah and then the next question is about ophthalmology Ophthalmology has its own, if I'm not mistaken, it's run through. Ophthalmology has two types, yeah, medical, medical ophthalmology or surgical surgery. ophthalmology. If you yes. want to do medical ophthalmology, then you have to go through internal medicine training two years and then ophthalmology for four years. Surgical ophthalmology is a completely separate branch, uh, which starts from uh, ST1 and it, they have, you have to go through FRC ophthalmology exams and everything, which are very well discussed in our surgical training in the UK article. Uh, we have made a separate uh, uh there are links to it please go and check it out if you are willing to do surgical uh, ophthalmology yeah I'm, I'm really glad that we're helping people i like i like the little thank you thank you all right <laughs> uh, like we said before though you did get you do get paid you don't have to pay to work okay um and then okay so when it comes to when you have your application so somebody's asking about how do you choose where you want to work okay so when we started off in our non-training post we were working in yorkshire which is Where? northern northeast england okay so when we were choosing where we wanted to do our internal medicine training you can rank your preferences once you get to that point in your in your training application they tell you okay here are all the seats that are available throughout the united kingdom so in scotland northern ireland england and wales here are all the places that you can apply we knew we wanted to stay in england Okay, we also knew that we didn't want to stay in Yorkshire anymore. We wanted to go somewhere a little bit warmer. I mean, Yorkshire is beautiful. No, nothing wrong about Yorkshire, but it was very cold and I liked, you know, having a sea beach. So we moved somewhere where there was a sea beach. So we put all of those preferences at the top, at the top places and, that were near coastal areas because that's also what we at wanted. at the same time, we looked at the which hospital. hospital and specialties. So yeah. how to, you cannot actually choose a hospital. The hospital basically chooses you in terms of your ranking. So when you go through an application process of a training or everything you're given a rank say uh, you have become all the applicants that applied you have become 200 say and uh, for internal medicine training they have a 1000 post so definitely uh, we can say for certainty that you will get a post but where do you get the post depends on how you choose your preferences now say so you have 1000 post so out of 1000 if you want to rank all the 1000 you can do that but as you said, your factors determine what you don't want to do. Say we didn't want to go to Northern Ireland. We didn't want to go to Wales or Scotland. So that's say keep a chunk of 400 seats are gone. So we have 600 left. So out of the 600, say Yorkshire had say 100. Mm. So we left all the, the so we have 500 left. So say Ibris rank 200 in the entire uh, application scoring and everything. So now Ibris have to think about of the all the 199 people in front of her, where will they choose because if they choose all of them to london that means it's less likely breeze will go into london because yeah. london probably has only 50 seats and if all the above 199 people chooses london there will be no seat in london so you have to be thinking about what's your ranking if you rank first you said you can take whatever you want <laughs> you can take whatever you want whatever you give the first rank you will get it so if you rank a 1000 when you have 1000 seats that means you have to be really careful about what you give your preferences because now now it's thinking about what is a good preference and what is a bad preference. It's all depends upon you. Where do yeah. you want to go? And what, what amenities are there? Don't exactly. just think about, I want to be in London, London. because or I want to be in Manchester or Birmingham or, or it has to be this city. If you have family restrictions, that's another thing. 
but also look into the type of program and what that hospital offers you. Yeah. All right, like how good is their postgraduate medical center? What about the study budget? What about you know relocation? And what, what kind of, of what, what kind of exposure you're getting? Like if yes. you want to be a gastroenterologist or yeah. a cardiologist, you choose a hospital because it's London. But all the cardiology patients are basically shipped to another hospital because that there is a urgent care and yeah. uh, the hospital next to it has a primary uh, uh, coronary intervention or sorry um, PCI, PCI or whatever uh, uh, is in, in somewhere else. So that means you're not getting any exposure to cardiology, even if you are, are in working in London. So you have to think about the, the hospital. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The catching area of the hospital and how many patients you get. All right, information regarding portfolio for anesthesia training in the curriculum, you can find it on their website or on the ST3 recruitment website. Even if you go through Oreo, they have everything kind of divided out nicely, and then you can choose from there whichever training you are interested in pursuing. All right. I completed cardiothoracic surgery in Pakistan and will join in a non-training job in Leicester. Can I get into training or CSR route better? It's up to you. If you think that you meet the eligibility criteria for training, you can go for training. CSR is not a walk in the park. It is very difficult. There are a lot of things that you have to do and a lot of boxes you have to tick. And so you have to prove and it can take more than six to nine months it can take for a while. GMC to give you a, a verdict. And if yeah. they give you a verdict uh, that no, you cannot or it was not accepted, then probably you'll have to gain more evidences. See, what, what you can do, yes, you have completed a cardiothoracic surgery training in Pakistan. While you are working as a cardiothoracic doctor in the UK, you can actually gain more evidences to support your CSR application. A lot yeah. of doctors do that. A lot of British doctors do that. They don't go through a formal training, but they go through the non-training specialty doctor route yeah. and collect evidences a trainee would do that they, they do publication, they do uh, the C patients and uh, collect like, you know, uh, CBDs and mini yeah. cases and all the other things. And then puts it in the portfolio under the clinical supervisor telling that I want to do CSR in the long run. And the uh, clinical supervisor guides them like what evidences you would need for that application by GMC. Mm. So you can do that as well. So you may, may not have to go through the entire cardiothoracic surgery. It's, it would be better for you to work as a cardiothoracic registrar in, in UK for say, two, three years more or more than that, gain more exposure, gain more evidences to support your CSR application and yeah. then have apply a nice for strong CSR. application. Yeah. All right, to enter specialty training in psychiatry for someone who just finished internship in PLAB, it'd be a good idea to have your first job in the NHS to be in psychiatry or in something related to that um, that you can then put back to get you know your psychiatry points when you apply for psychiatry training. Okay. See, the NHS kind of jobs, non-training jobs are a very, uh, like, you know, it's very, I think it's a very good way to navigate your training. Like, you know, if you start as a doctor in psychiatry, as a non-training doctor, and you want to join psychiatry training, you can do so many things because you'll be working with psychiatry mm. trainees. You'll be working with psychiatry consultants. Yeah. So just ask them, like, you know, what do I have to do to get into training? How can I pass MR psych and every all the other things? Yeah. All right, um, how do I do CREST and a QIP in my home country? If you look at the CREST or the Certificate of Readiness to Enter Specialty Training form, it will tell you what you need to do. It may be difficult for you to do in your home country depending on what it asks for, but if you can prove it, you can prove it. Yeah, you just have to read up on what a QIP is. Yeah, quality improvement. Project, yeah, and, and to implement that. We have a detailed article about clinical audits and quality improvement projects. Mm. Just read that. We also have a video. Out. Yeah, we also have a video. We do, we do. Okay. I did the video. Is there a discrimination between IMG and UK past doctors? No. There are even some British doctors who passed abroad, so they would be international medical graduates even <laughs> if they're British. It's interesting. You'll also find UK past doctors who were not who are not British. So it can happen. So don't think there's any discrimination. There's not. Yes, this video will be posted on YouTube. MTI gives you GMC registration as long as you keep paying to keep that GMC registration and that license to practice. It's the same as PLAT. GMC registration doesn't go away. No. And it's the same GMC registration. Don't think that if I did PLAB and then he did MTI that he gets a better GMC registration. No. It's the same GMC registration. Even right. MRCP gets the same GMC registration. Yes. GMC registration doesn't have a good or better. It's just registration. Yeah. Yes. Um, to get into SC3 medical oncology, is it better to work in oncology or internal medicine department? There is no internal medicine department. So it would be better to work in oncology because I mean, if, you, if you have completed already MRCP done and you want to do oncology, then I think it's already if you work in oncology and work on call on acute medicine at the same time, that means you have some medical exposure, which will actually help you uh, gain your competencies as a medical doctor 
at the same time it's supposed to be an oncology so that you can prove your oncology application that yeah i've worked in oncology in the uk mm. so it's all about how you plan like you know an oncology doctor like we also have our cover shifts in oncology sometimes yeah. as an internal medicine doctor as well so we covered the doctors uh, we covered the uh, wards which are oncology hematology all the medicine related uh, jo- uh, w- words are covered by us internal medicine doctors on the weekends and everything yeah. so yeah it can it can be part of your rotation too so. yeah um tips to improve your cst portfolio if you go on to the evidences website that we had shown earlier in the webinar you can see what they want and then you just do those things for instance things like teaching things like you know doing audits or quality improvement projects publications research etc etc all of those then all can make the list, your like, portfolio go our, better go to our surgical training uh, pathway and we, uh, we have listed an entire list uh, what you have to do to enrich your portfolio. And then, of course, if you're in a non-training post, you can speak to other surgical trainees and ask them what they've done. Exactly. Do all the you know seminars and teachings and conferences and attend everything and just kind of put that all together to show that you want to do this. And then, of course, your own skill set. All right. Um, what about the competition at entering ST and surgery? We also covered that. All the competition ratios, guys, it's all there. I article. promise you. I promise you. <laughs> I it's promise all there. you it's in that article. <laughs> okay. Um, and then again, same with the progression of training into a specific specialty. It's all the same thing. Whether you once you've gotten your GMC registration, is it an uncoupled or is it a run through? And then knowing that, how would you then proceed knowing what the application criteria consist of? Okay. Can you teach in universities if you are a consultant? So that's a completely different pathway. Yeah. yeah. Um, for instance, yeah. I will say my educational supervisor. He is a professor because our our, uni- our hospital is affiliated with a medical university, a medical college. So he teaches at the medical college and he works as a hepatology consultant in, in the hospital. So his route is like that. He, he has so many degrees and extra degrees and all these other things also done. He's a professor and that has helped him obviously when he applied for that post. So when you think about teaching and you want to be a consultant, you have to see, do you meet the criteria just as if you, you have to see if you met the criteria for a training post, do you meet the criteria to apply for a teaching post. Sometimes people will go through what they call academic clinical fellowship routes, which if you look at the uh, video that we have with Dr. Taz Babaker, he talks about how he did that. Or I, I, I would say keep an eye out on the Oscar consultant series because we would definitely in terms of, uh, yeah. uh, I think Taz Babaker is also a teacher. He is, he is. Yeah. So that helps if you if you know so what they're already doing. I think, I think the general uh, uh, lowdown of the whole, if you want to be a professor or assistant professor or teach in a medical university, you have to be academically excellent as well. That means yes. you can't just complete specialty training and start teaching. You have to show that you, you've been teaching yeah, throughout. No, you have to do a master somehow. Yeah. You have to do some research. You have to do some a PhD relevant. at some point. Yeah, something, or something and, relevant. And, and, and then apply for a professor post or a, a teaching post in a medical university like you'd apply for a consultant post after you finish your training yeah pathway for sports medicine if i'm not mistaken is via internal medicine training and then you would apply as a specialty all right um i'm struggling with audits and publications how do i improve my chances speak to your post graduate medical center or medical education center or or there's a clinical governance yeah there is a clinical governance department of your entire trust i'm pretty sure you can reach them and tell, tell your position, like I work here as a, this man, this position, I want to get myself involved in any of the audits. Are you guys running any national audits that I can uh, participate in? Talk to the, I, not, if you if you make PGM your point of contact, I'm pretty sure they can show you the way who you have to contact. Like mm. Postgraduate medical education would be the first point of contact. Like I, I work as a doctor here, I want to do it, I take part in clinical audits that's already running, or come up with your own audit idea if you want to and run it through your consultant or senior doctors in the ward yeah. and then present it to the audit department. I want to do audit like this. If they approve, then you have your audit. Okay. Um, so one person has asked the same question like seven times. So it's very difficult for me to see what everyone else is asking. Guys, we're gonna run through and answer everyone's questions. But basically, I think, cause we're also running into another hour and a half of this at this yeah. rate. Let's try and, and figure out where we can find a wrap up point. But, um, Really, I think the fact of the matter is any information that you're looking for regarding specialty training, if not on our website, is available on the relevant Royal College's website for whatever training you're looking into. Um, Don't think that you have to be British 
or you have to be a local graduate to get into specialty training. All of those restrictions and barriers have been lifted. Don't think that there's any reason just because you are an IMG that you cannot get into any sort of training because like I said, it's, it's based on your application and what you put forth. It's not based on you know what your passport color is or anything like that. So even if a speci specialty is competitive, that doesn't mean as an IMG you cannot get into it. I really don't like the term IMG friendly for that because everything here has been made that way. I mean, you're already on a shortage occupancy list. You can apply alongside British graduates you have the same opportunities that are available to them. Only thing that you have to do is be dedicated in your application and do really well in your interview for you to get selected. We have internal medicine trainees, surgical trainees, you know, gynae peds, all these trainees from all over the world. So there isn't any sort yeah. of barrier except yeah. for whatever barrier you, you put in your front I, I in front of yourself. I don't know why people say that surgery is so like what I am just cannot do surgery, and when I go to Dairy Ford Hospital. And all the surgeons, all the departments that I work with, because when you work in ICU, you get to see a, a different kind of surgeons. Like you get to see orthopedics, you get to see plastic surgeons, you see abdominal uh, general surgeons and vascular surgeons, because you know they end up in ICU, the patients, and they come and see the patients. Most of them are international graduates. Yeah. Yeah. And I think they're so busy. I I wish we could just put a poster somewhere, like, can you just interview for Road to UK as an ASCA consultant? <laughs> We're trying to do that, actually. It's not yeah. that we don't. I mean, a lot of times you guys ask us, why haven't you um, interviewed somebody in that specialty? It's not that we've not asked them. I think I have probably cold called half of the hospital, but they have to have if time. If you guys know any other consultant that would be willing yeah. to talk to uh, the entire... Uh, uh, to, uh, to do an episode of, episode of, of Ask a Consultant. Ask a Consultant and reach to hundreds and hundreds of uh, uh, international medical gadgets to our channel. That's fine. We travel. Please, we've please, we've yeah, traveled we've, before to interview consultants. Please tell them to contact us or fine with that. give us the contact information so that we can contact with them. Yes. Yeah. The pay scales are the same for training and non-training guys. Don't worry about any of that. So I think, I think, and I, I might have missed some of y'all's questions and I apologize. It's just because I'm trying to, to wrap up without it becoming it like a, a two-hour thing. <laughs> but I think we've answered pretty much everything that you need to know regarding specialty training as well as the competition ratios, stuff about your portfolio, and just the general tips and advice and things that you would need to know to progress onwards. Um, and I think we've kind of covered all the relevant points. We'd really appreciate it, guys, if you could please do our feedback. Ibrahim's already linked it on the side. And, and also, also subscribe. I don't know. I don't know. A lot of people don't subscribe our channel. It's very... Ibrahim's bad now. <laughs> it would be nice. No, but you know, guys, we're, we're, we're really close to 10,000 subscribers. So we have a special video for 10,000 subscribers that's going to come when we hit 10,000. And of course, we'll try and do that for every, you know, more, every more 10,000 that we get. So at 20,000, 30,000. I, I, think, I think it just gives you a, a boost on what you do because we are obviously uh, doing this in our free time. Like today, Sunday and tomorrow we have night shift. So, so, <laughs> so uh, it, it's it's just gives you a, a, a an, an incentive to move and make more videos like this and make more sessions. I, I'm sure that uh, it, it's not possible for us to wrap everything up within two hours. I think no. we can talk about special training in the this UK. This would be like an all day session. All day session or yeah. anything. And, and we really want to put it in a time frame so that whoever is watching later on can at least have an idea about what time they would want because there is no point making a three hour video on YouTube. But All no right. Really <laughs> yeah. So guys, really, um, yeah, I hope that we did talk about things Please. and we at least, if we, if we put new questions in your mind, we hope we answered some first before we put the new ones in and that you understand the general structure now because I, I think that's where a lot of the questions come and the confusion starts about competition and, and the structures if you don't actually know what you're trying to do. But um, yeah, I, I hope we were helpful and I hope you guys will join us for any other videos or sessions that we have in the future. And we hope that everyone is fine and happy and safe. Anything else you would like to add? No, I think give us the feedback. That's it. Yes, please give us the feedback. <laughs> Ibrahim will be very sad otherwise. Okay. All right. All right, guys. Take care. Take care. Thank bye. you. Bye.